Coming up on Fishing Australia, we take stock of what's out there and consider a plan to get rid of one of our biggest pests. Throughout the ages, us anglers have wondered just how well our popular species are going. What are the stocks like? Well, dozens and dozens of our very best scientists have got together and prepared a report that we're going to look at. But first, there's a problem. I've seen it, communities have seen it, and now science has proven it. Of course, I'm talking about carp, a problem that has affected freshwater fisheries around this country. There's a plan in place that could be the solution, and we're going to take a look at that. If I listen to local people that have been living on these rivers for decades, describe what these waterways were like, they're describing clear waters, lots of platypus, fish, abundant fish, and now that we have carp in our rivers, we're seeing sludgy waterways, murky water. Having known what the river was with that crystal water, you know what I mean? Like, geez, if you could get that river back to having that clear water again, you know, that'd be something. We've heard from local communities who are out in these regions and have seen their waterways change over time. But we've had the scientific community look at this issue a lot as well, uh, over here in Australia and overseas. And what that science is saying is that carp affect water quality, uh, they, they muddy waters, uh, carp disrupt our natural food cycles and food webs in our inland waterways. So they eat things like zooplankton and small crustaceans, uh, and those that upsets the balance in our system. So we end up with not many plants in our systems and more things like algae and carp. And they exclude and outcompete native fish who are used to having clearer waters and plants in their waterways. And so we're, we're seeing our waterways degrade and we're seeing the quality in, in our waterways reduce. And that's a real problem for people because um, our waterways are precious um, resources for our farming systems, but they're also places which the community enjoy to, uh, to be, and so they're really important for community wellbeing. For decades now, carp have marauded our waterways, gouging and gorging, displacing our native fish and degrading pristine river systems. Carp are more than just a pest, they're a serious threat, and that's why the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation, or FRDC, has been working on the National Carp Control Plan. Jamie Allnut is the plan's coordinator. We've been given the task of uh, investigating the use of a virus for biocontrol of carp in Australia. Uh, carp has been a problem in Australia for, for 50 years. Um, we're in a location now at the upper part of, of one of the catchments in the Murray-Darling Basin and there's carp here. So carp has, over that 50 year period, since it was released into Victoria, um, has, has migrated extensively throughout Australia. And so we were given the task of looking at a biocontrol method as an effective way of controlling carp. And that task was built on 10 years of previous research undertaken in institutions such as the CSIRO here in Australia, pioneering research, that said probably the best bet we've got at this point in time is something like a, a virus, this carp virus, because it's very specific to carp and, and it will kill carp. The so-called carp virus is basically a strain of herpes. The FRDC's National Carp Control Plan has been exploring the possibilities of this virus. But, as Jamie explains, there's still more to do before a final decision is made. The research is giving us a good knowledge about how we could possibly use the virus, um, but there are still risks. We need to acknowledge there's still risks, and there always will be risks with introducing a, a, a biocontrol um, at a continental scale. So, yeah, the epidemiology research is really critical to the, to the whole plan. It, it's working out how the virus will actually control carp in, in the Australian situation. 
So we're looking at what's happened with the virus overseas, where it exists in 33 countries, and we've done a lot of work in Australia to work out how the virus will move through carp populations. And what that research is finding is something, a few really interesting facts. The, the virus will only work when the water temperature is between 18 and 28 degrees. Um, it'll work when there's a, a, a concentration of virus in, in, in place. Um, and it, it works when carp are a little bit stressed. Um, like most viruses, they infect when the animals or the hosts are a little bit stressed. So that's probably around the spawning time it'll work. And the other big key to epidemiology and the whole plan is it works in skin-to-skin -skin contact. So we're, we're, we haven't confirmed that yet, but if, it's, if the virus is only transferred by skin-to-skin -skin contact, then aggregations, where carp aggregate or group or where they have skin-to-skin -skin contact, is where the virus will be effective. So there's all those preconditions that we've worked out is where the virus is going to be effective. And what that means is that we can start to consider the virus as, as more of a surgical type of tool. Under specific conditions, we know it will work. That criteria of aggregation, where large numbers of carp group, has prompted the NCCP to instigate another initiative, the CARP map. The CARP map is all about communities, locals observing where the carp are and their numbers. And when we come back, we'll talk to some of those on the front line. This special episode of Fishing Australia is taking stock of our fisheries and looking at the National Carp Control Plan aimed at tackling a serial pest. Carp have been in Australia's inland waterways for over 100 years, but have really exploded in numbers over the last 50 years. Just how many carp there are in Australia is still under investigation, but it's one of the cornerstones of the NCCP's 19 research projects all aimed at eradicating this marauder. Even though carp's been a problem for, for 40 or 50 years in Australia, we've never actually worked out how far and wide carp are and how, how, how much population there is. So we haven't got an accurate map of, of where carp are located. So any control needs to understand where carp are. So we've, we've, we've commissioned an assessment of the amount of biomass of carp. Um, and we're now standing on the upper reaches of the Murrumbidgee on a tributary that, tributary that runs into the Murrumbidgee. Yeah. And that research has identified that there's 4,000 tonnes of carp yeah. in the upper Mur Murrumbidgee River down towards Narandra. Yeah. So that's before the Murrumbidgee breaks out into those big broad floodplains. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got high amounts of biomass beyond there right down to the, down to the mouth of the Murray. So we're in the most upper reaches of the Murray-Darling Basin and, and uh, we have carp here. And we've been hearing stories from local people about the, the problems and the issues that, that carp bring to these areas, even in the most upper reaches of the Murray-Darling Basin. As the coordinator of the National Carp Control Plan, Jamie Allnut is well versed in the considerations surrounding the potential release of a virus aimed at attacking this pest. The research continues and in the meantime, another initiative is underway to assist in assessing carp numbers. The NCCP has created the Carp Map, an interactive site set up for communities and individuals to help pinpoint populations. These aggregations or gatherings need only be a dozen carp or more. So if you wanna help carp control and know where carp are aggregating, then please go to carpmap.org.au. The survey only takes a few minutes. Just a short drive from Cooma in the New South Wales High Country is the town of New Morella, one of many places where having boots on the ground is a vital part of saving our national biodiversity. It's really interesting, but in the Upper Murrumbidgee, we didn't actually know where the carp spawning aggregations are. And this is where we're really interested to talk to the New Morella Fishing Club, which are local people passionate about their local river, live and work on the river and really know what's going going on here and they were able to identify where they're regularly seeing spawning, where we're regularly seeing aggregations of carp and also where the carp nursery breeding grounds are. So without local people knowing their local waterways we wouldn't actually have that information 
And in a lot of cases, we don't have the resources to um, conduct surveys to find this information out. So citizen science and local information is extremely valuable as a starting point to try to solve these problems. Brett Jones and Roger Roach are local landholders and members of the Numerella Fishing Club. So Brett's been here 15 years, but you've been here all your life, Roger, some 40 years. Um, tell me about what this river was like before carp and what's happened. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, I've been here all my life. The, the 70s, through the 70s, we were kids fishing on the river and the water was crystal clear. Um, there was nothing to catch. You could catch fish every afternoon, trout fish. And so you saw all your platypus, your turtles, all your, all your yabbies and that sort of stuff. 80, 81, 82, they were drought years. Um, we noticed the first change in fish. We didn't really know what carp were then. And, uh, um, and then from then onwards, from the uh, mid 80s onwards, we saw the river. The, the one thing I've noticed the most when the carp got in, in in those 80s and onwards now was just the water quality. It went from having crystal clear water to, to the soupy water we've got, got now. And that's probably the biggest change that I've noticed was just the water quality. Yeah. Tell me about some of the numbers of carp you see here sometimes. Yeah, well, we, well, do you, want to, do you want to talk about the mud marlin world? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can. So we yeah, run a fishing competition each year. Yeah. Um, it's a week-long long, week -long competition, um, generally through the summer months when the kids are on school holidays and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So last year we caught 10,297 carp. Yeah. Now, admittedly, a lot of them are these little fellas, and that's, I guess that's what we harp on about, yeah. is we know we're a big breeding area through here, yeah. and you can go through and catch thousands upon thousands of these little fellas. Yeah. And that's, I guess we target them too late by the time we target them little fellas. If we can hit them when the spawning runs on, yeah. before they're even hatched, then that'd be ideal. Carp have occupied much of southeastern Australia, and there's a strong likelihood they will continue to spread north at the expense of our native fish, like cod, whose environment stands little chance against such a voracious adversary. It hasn't changed the, uh, the density of the carp yet. yet. Um, they've been a problem, and, and all, the, all the structures, all the releasing of the native fish um, into it sort of thing. So you've released native fish here? Yeah, the, the Brett, what numbers would we put in there oh, now? For 10 years we've been releasing Murray Cod and Golden Perch. Yeah. To that, that predatory pressure against the small carp. And over the 10 years would have been 200 to 250 odd thousand fish. Yeah. And in this case it hasn't worked releasing the natives that might eat the... No, no, the, the, the carp. We, we, haven't, we haven't seen a change really. Of, of all the natives we've released in there, we haven't seen a change in, in, the, in the carp numbers at all. While the National Carp Control Plan has been underway for a couple of years, the scope of research has been expanded and there's still much to do. Look, we're all on track at the moment. We've had, we've been fortunate to have an extension of a year mm -hmm. uh, and we're doing that to do some further research and talk to stakeholders. So we're on track to deliver a report to government by December to this year, 2019. And that report's really important because that's going to do, answer two questions. Is it feasible to release the virus in Australia? And if so, how could we do it in the most effective way to manage risks um, and, 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 and be, so it's cost effective as well? When the draft of the National Carp Control Program is finalised at the end of 2019, the decision whether to move forward and look at releasing the virus is going to be left with these guys. It's certainly one of the biggest decisions in terms of how the health of our rivers might move forward in my lifetime. It goes without saying, we Australians love our seafood and we're lucky to have such an abundant marine ecosystem. Its quality and diversity is envied the world over, so preservation and management of our aquatic life is fundamental. The status of Australian fish stocks, a monumental report assembled by hundreds of scientists and experts, has just been released and the news is good. Look, it's really exciting work, uh, it's important work uh, and now that we've got four um, in the series out it's showing a clear trend of improvement which is fantastic. 85% of the stocks uh, are sustainable or in, in recovery uh, and this year a really exciting piece of news with southern bluefin tuna going from um, uh, the red to the yellow so it's now in recovery uh, and a clear trend in that space which is really good news for those who enjoy it, commercial wrecks and indigenous, uh, but also shows the value of good fisheries management that we practice here in Australia. This is the fourth Status of Australian Fish Stocks report, 
but it's by far the most comprehensive ever compiled by the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. Peter Horvat is from the FRDC. It looks at crustaceans, finfish, sharks, the, the whole bag and dice. Uh, extensively what we've looked at is uh, starting with the biomass, looking at how many fish are in the ocean and whether we're harvesting them at a, an appropriate rate. Um, from that we can then work out um, the, the status, whether they're sustainable, they're depleting, you know, they're going down or they're recovering. The report is more than just a snapshot of our marine life. It's a deep dive into the detail. And as the FRDC's Crispy and Ashby explains, it opens up a whole new dimension of resources. This is an exceptional tool for us anglers, you know. It's no more of this sort of pub talk or fishing club talk, or I had a bad day today on, on the flatties, I must be getting wiped out. This is, this is the facts that you guys have put together and it's a great tool for us anglers to know about yeah. before we go fishing. No. Absolutely. I mean, it contains a whole bunch of comprehensive information. In some cases, the time series of data goes back 10 years or more. And so these assessments basically will look at the time series of information. Yeah. It'll look at what the status of those fish are doing and also will take into account things such as maybe um, changes in the, the movement of those species, as we've seen in, in um, cases even on the east coast here. You see quite a lot of subtropical and tropical species moving down the east coast to more southern waters. Yeah. And so the fact that a fish may not be there may not mean it's gone, it just means it may be moving around. Yeah. And so we've seen in WA the heat wave event is caused actually, you know, some issues with, with some of the stocks. And, and what we've seen is, is a build up post those heat wave events as well. Yeah, so th this is dynamic, which is fantastic. It's continually updated. And speaking of being dynamic, we can get it up on our phone before we wet a line. So it's yeah. with us all the time. Yeah, for the first time this year, we've actually put together a, an app. So we've actually got on both the Android and, and Apple platforms, yep. we, we have an app for the status of Australian fish stocks. Yep. So it contains some of the summary information and, and really sort of a quick level of information you can have a look at. And then if you want further detail, you can drill down into the website from the app. How many of the fish stocks studied so far have been listed as sustainable? So of those that were assessed, um, it was in the order of almost 80% were classed as sustainable. Yeah. And People might think that that 20% that's unsustainable, well, that's, that, that's not necessarily bad news, is it? Because this, this project now allows, allows the whole of Australia to look at that and, and see what we can do? No, that's exactly right. I mean, what we want to make sure we do is we don't, you know, is, we need to make sure it's based on the facts. So if we do have a problem with the stock, yeah. we want to make sure that that's known. Yeah. What it does for us is it highlights yeah. areas of research or areas of management that may be required to ensure that what we can do is if it is a depleted stock, we can look at recovering it. If it is a stock that is depleting, maybe some management right now can be put in place to make sure it comes back up to sustainable. When we come back on this special episode of Fishing Australia, we head out for our own little stock take. I'm with Crispy and Ashby, a marine scientist from the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. He's joined me to shed light on the recent Status of Australian Fish Stocks report, a comprehensive study of our marine life and the sustainability of our fishing and seafood industries. We're on board with local fisho David Johnson on the New South Wales South Coast, heading out to wet a line and dare I say, take stock. Well, Crispin, we've done the research. Now it's time to put in into practice, mate. So you fire away. What we've got here, we're on St George's Basin and mixed bag, flathead, brim, whiting, jewfish, tailor, all the species that you'll see on the app and you can read up on them. And uh, look, Crispin, you haven't got a lot of time. He's busy making sure our fish stocks are looked after, but we'll have a quick flick and see what we come up with. Oh, look, one thing with science is that you always have to have lots of replicates, so you've got to try, try again. <laughs> I like it. The Fish Stocks report has found that more than 80% of our species are regarded as sustainable. And for species that fall outside that criteria, it provides strategy to bring them back. Crispin, while the status of Australian Fish Stocks report is a, an immense body of work by so many bright scientists and is of so much value as it is, um, Surely it's some sort of roadmap to the future as well? No, absolutely, Rob. What we see is that with now the fourth edition of the report, what we've been able to do is track through time over the eight years of the report. It's run every two years. We can see the trends through time. We can see where we're getting improvement. We can also see where potentially we're going to have some problems. And what we can then do is we can look at management and research to address some of those issues and then hopefully get some recovery going for some of those species that could be in trouble. 
So, Crispin, now that we've got the report and all that fantastic work's been done to date, what is the next step? What's the future? Well, we are looking at um, uh, another report for 2020. So we're looking to continue this with the jurisdictions and with all the scientists around Australia. We're also developing um, web, better web-based portals for each of these jurisdictions to be able to uh, collaborate and harmonise their research a lot better. We're also looking at, um, we're about to uh, also launch the report card of sharks okay. in Australian waters. Um, and also we're looking at sort of broadening it from stocks to look at the broader um, uh, concept of fisheries and fisheries and, and the environment to look at how we can holistically manage, you know, as much as they're doing off here in New South Wales with the marine estate, holistically manage the resource. The breeze had picked up and it was time to call it a day, but not before we had a visit from this little fella. Well, <laughs> it's blowing a gale here, so much so that I've got a fish on that's drifted under the boat while uh, Crispin's still having a cast over there. Um, very light hooks on this, so I've just got to take my time with it. What we have there is a legal size snapper. Um, oh, if I can get him into the net, I might need a hand here, Crispin. What do you like on the net, mate? I don't know, only one way to find out. Here we go, I'll lead him to you. You keep that net still and I'll bring him to you. Yeah, hey, there you go. Well, um, and there's another species that's, uh, you can look up as well. Beautiful snapper. Yeah, yeah, it's sustainable in New South Wales. Well, I think we'll let this little snapper go and uh, we've had a fun day out. She's a little bit windy, so she's time to pack it in, but um, great to learn about your, um, your website, your status of Australian fish stocks and all the work that's been put into it that's helping fishermen like us uh, manage the stock, mate. Uh, thanks, and thanks for the day in the water. It's been fantastic.